about five, six years ago now, I, along with Paul Goslin, who's now a deputy director at DWR, at that time he was with Butte County, and Graham Fogg from UC Davis, we wrote a white paper to the governor's office saying, we need to acquire geophysical data. We have this challenge of sustainable groundwater management, and how are we ever going to get the information we need about our groundwater systems if we continue to keep just drilling wells? So we said, there is a technology, we have to do this. It's a helicopter deployed geophysical system. We could fly over the groundwater basins of California and map out what's down there. So DWR came back and said, hmm, sounds interesting. And then we're part of funding a two-year pilot study that I ran with a lot of other partners and collaborators. After two years, we'd mapped out what we felt was the optimal workflow to actually do this acquire airborne EM data over all the groundwater basins of California, and DWR is close to completing that. So 25,000 kilometers of data, flight lines, and along these flight lines, it's like a slice into the ground. And you can see a thousand feet down, mapping out where are there sands and gravels that we pump to get our groundwater, where are there clays that act as barriers to flow. So I'm continuing to work with DWR. I'm on their advisory committee, their technical advisory committee for this statewide Airborne EM project. And uh, I actually have a meeting with them tomorrow. We're going to be exploring what next. Are there other ways that a, research, a researcher at Stanford could collaborate with ongoing efforts to better utilize these data? I've said, aha. No, I didn't say aha. I went, wow. So. When you look at these data, it's the idea that you can just peel back layers and look deeper and deeper below our feet into the groundwater systems. And one of the things you start seeing are areas where you've got large packages of coarse-grained permeable material like sand and gravel. You see areas where there's a lot of clay that's going to prevent water from moving into the subsurface. And you immediately start thinking about, I'm seeing pathways, places where we can actually get water from the ground surface below the ground. And you realize that we're often so focused on our engineered infrastructure above the surface that we forget to utilize effectively the natural infrastructure that's below the surface. And so if we can connect our engineered infrastructure to our natural infrastructure and think about managing our water that way and getting water back into our groundwater systems. That's when I look at these data and go, wow, what an opportunity. Uh, Graham Fogg, a professor of hydrology at UC Davis and one of his students, Gary Weissman, a number of years ago now, started thinking about what happened at the end of the last glacial period, where you had the glaciers at the top of the Sierras that then rapidly started melting. And all that melt water, very high velocity water coming down out of the Sierras, they suggested carved or incised valleys out where the river comes out of the mountains. And then that flood water, that melt water, delivered a lot of coarse grain material to then fill up those valleys. They called these incised valley fill deposits. So they are like a paleo valley in the sense that it was at one time a valley. They're like a paleo channel in the sense that it was at one time a river channel. But it's now this feature where we've got a package of coarse grain materials that starts right where the river comes out of the mountains and then extends out into the central valley going deep below the surface. And so it's like a fast path where if we can connect with it at one location, we can actually move water down deeper within the groundwater system of the valley. Graham and his students suggested that you could find these features associated with most of the major rivers coming off the Sierras. They went to the Kings River and spent, oh, at least a year looking at the surface, mapping out what was present there, putting in wells and boreholes and getting samples of material back, and they started finding these packages of cobbles and coarse grain material. So they drew an area on a map and said, one of these incised valley fill deposits, one of these 
end of the last glacial period, Paleo Valleys has to be here. We took the Airborne EM system and flew back and forth to see if we could find it with the Airborne EM system, and we could. It was right there in the data. What's exciting then is we can find these other features elsewhere in the Central Valley. We can now fly this helicopter deployed system and locate areas where we have these 30 kilometer long features, three kilometers wide, and we can see where they come to the surface. And in areas where they come to the surface, that's where we can direct our flood water and tap into, someone called it like a natural storm drain or nature's storm drains, get the water there and move the water down into the groundwater system. There are a number of water districts that are working frantically to take advantage of this snow melt, all the excess water that's coming down. First of all, they need to mitigate flood risk. So if there's somewhere they can move some of that water, that's great because it could prevent more serious flooding. So water agencies, I know in Tulare Irrigation District, the water manager down there, has been doing a lot of recharge. So moving this water through there, the system that they have for moving surface water around in that area, getting it to growers who are making their fields available to receive this water, moving the water into constructed recharge basins. So what's happening right now is a lot of people out there on the ground trying to figure out where they can move this water and how they can use this water to fill up the empty space that's been left behind because of the drought. A colleague of mine always says there's no such thing as extra water. Nature has figured out how to use much of the water that's as a, that is available. But when we have winters like this, when we have floods like this, obviously there's an opportunity for us to divert some of that water. And as you said, think about constructing the infrastructure on the ground surface to move this water into specific locations. So a lot of the work we do is figuring out if you were gonna start moving water around to get it down below the ground surface, where are those optimal locations? Where are those sites where there's a good connection from where you might spread the water on the ground surface down into the groundwater system? So where are there those optimal sites for recharge? That's what we focus on. I don't see it as a fight as what is the biggest opportunity we have ahead? And I think the huge opportunity we have ahead is everyone in California pulling together and thinking about how do we get better at managing this shared resource that is a critical part of so much of what we do in this state. It's needed by domestic well owners, it's needed by agriculture, it's needed by our urban centers, and it's needed by our natural ecosystems. So how do we start thinking about ways to best manage our water. And one of the things I'm very interested in right now is sufficiently understanding the natural system so that we could start taking more of a, what I say, a nature first approach to land use planning and to zoning. Like imagine if we started mapping out areas and discovered this is an optimal place to recharge the groundwater system. Let's have it zoned recharge so that you don't develop and put out impermeable surfaces in this area. This is designated forever. It's zoned for recharge. So I think we have a real opportunity to step back and think holistically about how to manage our water in a way that provides a sustainable supply of water for all the various stakeholders, all the various users, including natural ecosystems who can't speak for themselves. Yes, well, when you start looking at the subsurface and trying to understand the geology of the Central Valley, the Central Valley is predominantly filled with a lot of fine-grained material that water doesn't move through easily. But there's enough of these channels, these connected pathways of sand and gravel that you can find good locations where the water can move into the subsurface. But right at the base of the foothills, where the rivers exit the mountains and come into the valley, you get what's called alluvial fan deposits. When the rivers exit the mountain, they slow down, they drop their sediment load. And so if you look at those areas, right along the valley edge, 
there are great opportunities for recharge in those areas. So you're right, you could be replenishing the groundwater system in these areas and replenishing the groundwater. So next steps, there's still a long way between the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and achieving groundwater sustainability. And agencies have been working flat out to put groundwater sustainability plans in place. And some of them have been found to be inadequate. And quite frankly, I just see the lack of data being a big part of the problem. So with the state providing these airborne electromagnetic data, these data that allow you to image what's below the surface, I think there's a real opportunity here to help the water agencies now work with these data and see how these data can help them improve and inform their planning. One of the things we're working on is thinking about what are the questions agencies have and how do we go from these data to get answers to their questions. And this is where we are partnering with some of the water agencies and saying to them, what is a critical question you have about the functioning of the groundwater system in your area? And then we go, how could we process and analyze and work with these data to help them answer that question? It's all about what's the connectivity between various parts of the groundwater system. So for example, if we were to put new wells deep in the aquifer here and you go oh great no one's pumping down there i'm just going to put a well in and pump a lot and that's going to provide the water i need for irrigation what impact is that going to have on all these shallow domestic wells over here so understanding the connectivity and understanding the unintended consequences of various actions in order to make decisions about what actions are appropriate, you need a good understanding or a good model of how your groundwater system operates. And that's where data such as these come in. Helps you build a model that better captures. For example, if I put a well in here and you've got a well over there, is me pumping my well just going to lower the water and take it out of your well? That's the sort of questions we need to answer. That's a good one. I tear up when I think about it. <laughs> now I gave a talk recently and I said for 30 years I've been working on using geophysics for groundwater management. And when something like this happens, it's one of those moments in life where you just go, tick. <laughs> so truly amazing, just thrilling. Right place at the right time. It's gotta feel like one of those almost NASA moments where you can't believe you're part of kind of starting. I know. Yeah. Yeah, no, really. You just go, what an amazing time to be a geophysicist in California. <laughs> and in a new school of sustainability, where there is a real commitment to supporting faculty and students working on research that has applications to solving problems. The banner over my door has always been knowledge into action or science to solutions. So I've always wanted to do far more than publish in the refereed literature. You know, I've always wanted to be able to take what we're doing and make it useful and have it adopted more broadly. And that's what's happening now when we see how groundwater geophysics is being used in California. This is putting Stanford on the map in terms of a commitment to solving the biggest problems facing us on this planet, climate change and sustainability. And I think for an institution like Stanford to say, we are committed to educating the next generation of students, to empowering our faculty, students and staff to solve problems is a huge statement about what we value. And it's a change from the traditional form of academia in many places. It's a, certainly a change from Stanford, although in many ways it's coming back to Stanford's founder, Jane Stanford, who said, to paraphrase, I'm creating this university to educate students to go out into the world and to do good. Knowledge for the sake of knowledge, I mean, knowledge is fabulous. We all love those grappling with the secrets of the universe moments. But knowledge that actually goes out and solves problems, that's even better. <laughs>